Right, so this is uh, the talk I gave a week ago at the uh, World Congress of the Bernoulli Society and uh, the IMS, Institute of Mathematical Statistics in Bochum, in Germany. Uh, it was a, just a contributed talk, scheduled to take half an hour. And uh, as usual, I only got halfway through my slides. There are only 20 odd. Now, this uh, uh, in the first slide here, you can see the title of the talk, Statistical Issues in Cases of Investigation of Possible Medical Misconduct. And uh, that title of the talk is also the title of a report published by the Royal Statistical Society. And uh, over here, you can see the QR code, which will take you to the web page of the Royal Statistical Society, where you can uh, find a short version of our report, of, of a report which we, which I wrote with some colleagues, and uh, a longer version. Uh, this report was uh, written over a period of two years, and it was finished and uh, sent to all uh, relevant parties in the Lucy Letby case, or concerned parties, um, a month before the trial of Lucy Letby started in the in in England. Um, that trial lasted uh, 10 months, as perhaps you know. Right, so the subtitle is A Tale of Two Lucy's, and I'll explain that in a moment, on the next slide probably. And the other bigger QR code is actually a, a link, will give you a link to the, these very slides published by myself on SlideShare. Okay, sorry, it's a bit gimmicky, but I was, this is the first time I tried out making those. QR codes. Okay, now let's see if I can go to the next slide. Yes. So here are the two Lucys. And on the left, you see Lucia de Berg, a Dutch nurse who was uh, arrested in 2001 in December after, after uh, a short police investigation, which only took a few months, into events at the hospital where she'd recently been working, where she'd been she had been working for a, a, a year or two and previously worked at several other hospitals. The police investigation led to a trial, a first trial in 2003, where she was convicted largely on the grounds of, of a statistical probability calculation. A colleague of mine came up with the chance of one in 342 million that uh, she would have been present at so many suspicious events if that had been purely a matter of chance, if, if, if her presence at all those events was just random, was just chance, the chance of chance. The, she was retried in 2004 because her defence uh, team um, appealed against the conviction which she got for many deaths, uh, for many murders and many suspected murders. Defense too, sorry, prosecution too appealed. Uh, they, they wanted to convict her for more. They had charged her for many more. So the trial was repeated in 2004 at the higher court. And this time, no statistics were used. No probability was used according to the judges who convicted her finally in a, in a um, so-called inquisitorial trial, trial by a, a board of three wise judges, no jury. Uh, the judges said a, a probability, a statistical probability calculation plays no role whatsoever in our judgment. Uh, we convict her solely on the grounds of irrefutable scientific medical evidence. That's what they wrote on the first of 150 pages of uh, uh, explanation, case by case, of their judgments of uh, many of murder and uh, uh, that Lucy Lucia had committed murder and attempted murder many times. The, the case went up to the Supreme Court. Uh, that was turned down in two thousand five. For her conviction was definitive. Now, um, <clears throat> just at that time some whistleblowers started gaining attention of, of uh, journalists in the media, and people started getting 
that, that, and though the, the population of the Netherlands as a whole was uh, convinced that Lucille de Berg was an evil person and, and uh, it was right that she was in jail for life, uh, people started questioning this and that gradually grew. And uh, I was involved uh, from uh, end of 2005 and for the next uh, five years uh, very intensively in campaigning and, and arguing and talking to many, many, many people. So campaigning in public and campaigning behind the scenes for a, a, a fair retrial for the case to be reopened. As it was in, uh, I think the, uh, a new trial started in 2009 and concluded in 2010 with Lucia's complete exoneration. She, uh, she, got the, she received the personal apologies from the Minister of Justice and from the head of the Public Prosecution Service, the Dutch Public Prosecution Service. Uh, she received an enormous compensation for the wrong things that had been done to her, resulting in her being in jail for nine years altogether, right? Seven years sentenced and two years in pre-arrest. And nowadays, everybody, just about everybody, really everybody knows that that case was the biggest miscarriage of justice in the Netherlands for many years, and maybe one of the biggest ever. And uh, indeed, the justice system learned from it and uh, brought in a number of, of reforms. And uh, so it led to, to some good results. Now, the lady on the right is, of course, Lucy Letby. And in England, things move much slow, more slowly. So initial suspicious suspicions into of her by doctors at the hospital where she was worked, the, working, the Countess of Chester, uh, in Chester, in England, near, near Wales, near Liverpool. Uh, it, uh, so initial suspicions were raised by doctors to, to one another and later to management in 2015 and 2016. And this led to a, a criminal investigation which started in 2017 and continued up to 2020. So it was a, a long police investigation into events at the hospital at the, those initial two years, 2015 up to mid 2016. There followed a very long trial, 10 month trial, mm -hmm. and also after that, a, a two further uh, retrials, which I may or may not say some more about. Uh, and uh, anyway, by uh, 2024, uh, she was uh, definitively locked up for life, for her whole life, for a, a large number of murders and attempts at murder of tiny babies at, in the neonatal intensive care unit of the Countess of Chester Hospital. So there, this, and the cases have some very shocking similarities and those are very shocking similarities um, were apparent right from the beginning. So uh, the police investigation into Lucy Letby started in 2017 and rapidly, there were also, uh, they also put out um, press releases uh, and uh, the newspapers <laughs> that, that I, I read The Guardian, The Guardian reported uh, police were investigating a, a, a cluster of suspicious events at a hospital and, and they had particular interest in a particular nurse. Now, this is just exactly how the case of Lucia de Berg started at least as far as the public was concerned, with exactly such cryptic announcements in the newspaper originating from the police. And um, uh, similarly, well, actually about the same time, there were also announcements by the hospital saying uh, uh, people will have heard that there have been some disturbing events at our hospital and uh, please don't worry, uh, police are investigating and we have full confidence in them and uh, our interest as always only goes out to the care for our patients and we are doing all we can to care properly for our patients. 
this was also the same, absolutely the same. And later it turned out, that, well, later uh, it turned out that, that, that an exactly similar start kickoff happened to several other cases I got involved in after Lucia and before Lucy. Next slide. Well, okay, let me turn to the report and say something about it. So this is just a repeat and another chance for you to uh, go and read that report. And I want everybody to read that report and look at the recommendations we make. There are eight recommendations in the report. Uh, they are wise and well thought out and well, and they're argued, motivated, and they're based on ex vast experience and on statistical science, statistical knowledge and statistical understanding of problems of investigating such cases. And uh, uh, it's interesting to compare our eight recommendations with the actual process of the trial. <laughs> you will find that anything like our recommendations, well, which weren't available yet, obviously, but uh, already our recommendations to police investigators had been violated uh, big time and uh, our recommendations to, to experts and to the con parties in the conduct of the trial were, were, were violated big time also. Of course, that does not mean that the result was a miscarriage of justice, but it means that from a st statistical perspective, uh, the, <laughs> the stage was set for a possible miscarriage of justice. Right, he, these are the authors. Uh, there are five authors of the report, but, but it was um, uh, commissioned uh, by the lady on the middle of the bottom row, Jane Hutton, who was at the time uh, we five started working together, which was in 2020. We started working at, uh, around 2020 and worked till 2022. So that's two years we worked on our report. Uh, Jane Hutton was the president of the statistics and law section of the Royal Statistical Society. And um, uh, a number of us, the statisticians in the picture, which are the top row and Jane on the bottom, middle of the bottom row, uh, had been meeting and talking about the upcoming Lucy Letby case and, and uh, talking about past cases, past similar cases, at meetings, on, uh, at, at scientific meetings in statistics and law. O over the years, in fact, um, there is a whole community who's interested in, in, in the, uh, yeah, the, the evaluation of evidence from a scientific point of view, uh, which basically means from a probabilistic and a statistical point of view, not just, uh, I mean, most evidence is not clear cut. It's not decisive on its own. It needs, it needs evaluation and thought, and it needs supporting arguments. And those arguments cannot, uh, are often probabilistic or statistical. On the top left is uh, Peter Green, who is the chairman of our, of our group of five authors. In the middle on the top row is uh, Julia Montera, who's an Italian statistician with whom I have worked on an Italian case, Daniela Poggiali. And we got Daniela Poggiali out of jail through showing, by showing that the statistical arguments of the prosecution experts were nonsense and actually the uh, toxicological evidence of, of a top, an expert in toxicology was nonsense too, since, since the numbers which he used to do a calculation were based on statistical analysis of 150 bodies and post-mortem analysis studied by, collected by, studied by Italian police. And uh, when you take, took account of the statistical uncertainty in the estimate which he needed to do his uh, to make his argument that a certain woman had died of potassium chloride poisoning, uh, you, you, you found out that the, the, the number he used was so uncertain you couldn't conclude anything at all when the case uh, collapsed. I should mention that Peter Green on the top left was chairman of the Royal Statistical, president of the Royal Statistical Society at the time of the Sally Clark. 
um, case and the section statistics and law of the society were set up in response to that case because in that case statisticians learned and British statisticians learned in the hard way that lawyers and police do not understand probability and statistics and that when probability and statistics play an integral part in a criminal uh, prosecution uh, you can be pretty sure things are going to go wrong. On the bottom row, uh, left and right, are two lawyers. Bill Thompson is, is a, um, a, 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 a prominent, uh, I'm looking for the word I had to say, uh, famous and in a very positive way, highly respected academic and uh, practicing lawyer in the United States. So he works in academia as in, in uh, uh, academic, uh, in, in law as an academic object of study. And he is also active as a lawyer and uh, he, he is involved in, uh, he, he is involved in value in, has been involved for many years in the community which contains statisticians and probabilists and lawyers and talks about the evaluation of evidence in a statistical or probabilistic way, as is so often necessary. On the right is Neil Mackenzie. He's a practicing barrister in Scotland. So, uh, of course, Bill Thompson and Neil Mackenzie both work in, in different jurisdictions from the jurisdiction in England and Wales. Uh, Jane Hutton, on the other hand, is very, very familiar with it, and so is Peter Green. Uh, Julia Mortera and uh, I both work in, in jurisdictions using the inquisitorial system. We don't have, in Italy and in, in the Netherlands, you do not have a jury, you have a board of wise judges who are running an inquiry, uh, which has some advantages over the English system and the disadvantages of the English system most likely did play a role in the Lucy Ledby case in exacerbating it. Okay, but that's a, a judgment which uh, everybody uh, must make for themselves or may make for themselves after getting after getting to know a whole lot more about the case. Okay, so here yet again and now is the 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 front page of our report and I emphasize there again that this was available this was published a month before Lucy's trial started and actually made available to defense and prosecution and other parties the hospital the police uh, several months before that in a, a preview version uh, which we actually presented uh, to an audience of uh, stakeholders invited stakeholders in uh, Cambridge uh, a few months before the trial started altogether. This is the blurb on the web page of the Royal Statistical Society about our report, and I'm not going to read it all. I hope you go to the web page and read it yourself. The thing about this this kind of case is that the the, the fact finder, uh, the jury, has got two questions to consider. First of all, were there any murders at all? Was, was there, there criminal activity? This is different from a case where you find a body with a knife stuck behind its shoulder, his or her shoulder blades on the street or elsewhere, when you can be pretty sure, pretty sure that there is a murder and the focus is on finding out and punishing the person who, who did it. In a hospital scenario, on a hospital section or department or ward or unit where patients do die from time to time. And there are many such units in a hospital, uh, of course. Um, deaths are normal, of course, shocking and uh, emotional things. And maybe some of them are caused by medical errors. In fact, many of them, it's uh, the leading, no, it's the third most common cause of death in a hospital. Uh, after, after heart attack and uh, cancer, uh, I mean, cardiorespiratory illnesses and, and uh, cancer, those kill you in hospital, <laughs> of 
course, <laughs> they, they were killing you before. Uh, medical errors is, is the third most common cause of death in hospitals, of course. Of many of those deaths were perhaps going to happen anyway, but they happened earlier because of medical errors. So this is a situation where people do die and where people who are supposed to be helping patients um, uh, through a diff very difficult part of their lives, it's where mistakes are made and mistakes are often ignored or uh, hidden or uh, it's dangerous for a medical doctor to admit to making mistakes it has many many repercussions even if the mistakes are obvious and sort of no they shouldn't be admitted so we are also we are very concerned not just because of that reason but also because uh, of the pro problems of, of unconscious bias in influencing selection of cases and the, the definition of cases, deciding that some cases are suspicious or uh, surprising. Well, surprising, surprising things happen in hospital all the time, uh, even though there's a myth that everybody can always see what is coming. Um, uh, nurses know you can't see what is coming. Doctors uh, pretend that you can because they have got to give an aura of, of knowing what they're doing and knowing what is happening. And uh, words like stable don't really mean anything. This, this is a, a patient is stable means the doctor doesn't see anything right now going on, but there may be many things going on which he's not completely aware of. And the word stable is used to uh, keep, uh, keep, keep uh, family members or the patient themselves happy. Uh, you know, uh, the patient is stable. Well, it just means that there's nothing happening right at this moment, as far as we know. And it means, uh, it doesn't mean anything, in fact. But the word is used, misused in in, in criminal cases, like the, those of Lucia and Letby, it was misused numerous times. Doctors had said to, to pay to families that the patient was stable, right? And then something terrible happened, and Lucia was Lucy, Lucy or Lucy was connected either in doctor minds or in parents' minds. Right now, then the idea comes up in your mind: Could this be a killer nurse? Uh, we have recommendations. We have a very obvious recommendations. Uh, they are written out and motivated in full in our report and I want people who are interested to read it and the people who are interested in the Lucy Letby case especially to read it and think about whether anything like these recommendations were holding during the investigation. Now there was an unexpected cluster of bad outcomes at the Countess of Chester hospital neonatal intensive care unit and I've drawn sort of crosshairs here of uh, six years um, this, these are freedom of information data so the, the numbers are different from what you will find in other sources they are different in every source by plus or minus one uh, which tells us something about the reliability and arbitrariness of, of various um, of, of hospital data whether got from the hospital or the NHS or other or the police, uh, they change every time by small amounts, and this is nothing to be worried about. But of course, it does mean that uh, it is something one must be aware of. Two years are singled out, and uh, six uh, causes of death or types of events are listed. And we are focused on early neonatal deaths. This means deaths within the first so many days, and I forget how many days exactly, um, uh, maybe a week or so, and then it's called early neonatal. At some point, the death of a recently born baby is called a late neonatal death, and sometime later still it's called a post neonatal death. Um, you can also have stillbirths and miscarriages miscarriages first and <laughs> earlier and stillbirths closer to birth. And I will say straight away that the boundary of the red line between stillbirth, a baby is born dead, and early neonatal 
deaths, a baby dies soon after birth, is a somewhat arbitrary line. In fact, in England, England and Wales, uh, or England at least in the NHS, uh, a, a death which occurs within six or seven days, I forget which, and of course we should be very precise about what is are the what is the rule but okay there's a rule it's six or seven days and you have to count know how it is these are counted right calendar days days 24 hours periods from the moment of birth when is the moment of birth all these things play a role uh there's uh, during those six to seven days doctors preferably in consultation with parents can decide to call a death a baby was born live to call it a stillbirth uh, the, if, if the uh, if the baby is obviously not capable of life beyond a couple of days then you can imagine that parents uh, uh, might be happier to call it a stillbirth when they go home sadly devastated without the baby they'd been expecting. Um, you can expect that doctors might prefer for good and and for bad reasons not to call it a, a death, but to call it a stillbirth in, in instead. If it is a stillbirth, then there is no death certificate and in the hospital there's no auto autopsy. Um, it, well, the, the, how it's categorized makes a difference to hospital statistics and to hospital statistics make a difference to hospital funding as well as hospital reputation. So there are all kinds of reasons why that uh, uh, red line there is a worrisome red line, which is not as, as uh, accurate as, uh, it, as it appears. Now, two years are singled out, the year 2015 and the year 2016. And Lucy Letby was fully active, full time, working full time, and making many, many, making a great deal of overtime because she lived on site and she was saving money for a house and she was enthusiastic and young and she wanted to learn. And she was the most senior nurse in her unit, which is an amazing thing since she was rather very much, very young, much too young, and only just fully qualified as. Um, in neonatal intensive care nurse, which is more than just being a nurse or uh, or a pediatric nurse, it's much more. It's a higher level of qualification, giving you a higher, higher pay grade, of course, and higher responsibilities. And uh, uh, you can be given more difficult duties. You are you are allocated more demanding duties for more seriously ill babies than a nurse who does not have that qualification. So she started being fully qualified in January 2015. And mid 2016, that surge in the number of deaths on a unit, which you can see in 2015 was already painfully obvious. And it was uh, continued, the surge continued in the first half of 2016, as obvious as it had been before. Perhaps there are actually several separate surges. That's something statisticians and epidemiologists should look at. But anyway, uh, the worries about what was going on in the unit were so uh, uh, obvious and acute that mid-2016, from the end of June 2016, Lucy was taken off uh, ward duty. In fact, she was, she was uh, given administrative duties while further investigations were done into her um, degree of proficiency as a nurse. And an investigation was done into, separately, into the uh, possible cause of this uh, surge in the number the rate of deaths on the unit. Um, the next two years, the, the number of early neonatal deaths goes back to a couple per year. And before Lucy had been there in that function, it had been 
just a couple, three or so a year. And so there's two years eight uh, with big numbers, eight and seven. By the way, I'd like to point out a big number of stillbirths in 2015, surprisingly, perhaps shockingly large. And similarly, again, in 2017, but also the years 2013, 2014, that's, uh, that's, that seems large to me. Okay. Now, uh, but also statisticians aware of uh, personal variation will realize that these numbers could also just be chance. And anybody who, any statistician who switches on, fires up R and asks for six random numbers from the Poisson distribution with mean four, for instance, and makes six numbers, six random Poisson numbers with uh, expectation value four, will from time to time, if you repeat it half a dozen times, uh, you will see a number of times, you'll see two low numbers, two big numbers and two low numbers, just like the numbers here. In other words, this could still at this stage be just random variation when we look at the number of early neonatal deaths. It is not terribly, it is not gonna be statistically significant as it stands. Um, uh, but of course, it it does. Uh, it is saying something. It's saying that there might be something going on, and uh, it is of course in the hospital. It's vitally important to find out what, if anything, is going on. Is this just chance, or is there something going on? And actually, uh, so I will tell you, it was very easy to find what was going on, and uh, I will tell you that in a moment. Now, um, I'm jumping forward now. Well, <laughs> I'm, I was with this data. The, this, this data, this spike in the number of deaths was the, the reason for the police investigation and the reason for the trial and the reason Lucy Letby ended up in jail for life many times over. Uh, the police uh, certainly were... Well, who <clears throat> called in in 2017, as I said, early 2017, were immediately focused on Lucy Letby and immediately gathered data. And in fact, rather, they got data. They got they, they were given data from the hospital. I'll tell you about what they were told in a moment. But basically, the the hospital doctors already had a very strong idea that Lucy Letby was responsible for this surge. The senior uh, pediatric consultants on the unit. They, they suspected Lucy Letby and they um, uh, went to the police uh, showing them already actually an initial version of this spreadsheet which shows, it shows nurses in the columns. All the nurses who at some time or other during one and a half years, because this data, the data surged covered January 2015 through to uh, June 2016, up to and including June 2016, and it stopped dead. And it started at, in January 2015. Uh, that data had, the uh, hospital records had been searched for suspicious events and presence of nurses at suspicious events had been tabulated presence of nurses. The investigation was always nurse driven and it was performed initially and later advised, directed by, one could almost say, by senior hospital doctors. The senior hospital doctors who are actually the colleagues of these nurses working in the same unit and responsible for the uh, uh, medical care of patients on the unit. Lucy Letby is in the middle mark violet and uh, an X marks the presence of a nurse during a shift in which a suspicious event has been identified. And as you see, there are 25 suspicious events uh, happening to babies, A up to Q, which is 17 babies and a num number of babies occur a number of times. Um, a number of those babies are actually twins. Uh, a couple of them are triplets. And I've marked the twins and triplets with the little blue bar on the left. 
I've also marked the verdicts, guilty or not guilty, or no verdict. And um, I'm not quite sure what a missing verdict means altogether. Uh, what's the difference between a, a hyphen and a blank? I, I forget, but anyway, guilty and not guilty are the actual verdicts. Um, I've also marked which babies which of these events were actually deaths. Of course, a, a baby died, it might have been that the events which caused the death, if there were such, happened in a different shift or earlier. But anyway, uh, the daggers are, are, well, the daggers with, with a G are guilty verdicts of murder. And um, the, uh, these ones here, these, these guilty verdicts of, of attacking ch children F and G are, are murder attempts, I presume, I believe. Well, you can see the uh, column totals, which just have a massive... <laughs> well, Lucy let me was there every time something suspicious happened. Um, it would be more accurate to say Lucy Lippe was there every time she was thought to have been present at the bad event, which is on the list of indictments, attacks of babies causing directly death or, or attempting to cause death. So Lucy Lippe was uh, is alleged to have been there when she was alleged to have done something bad, which is, of course, a tautology. In fact, uh, it turns out later that one of those exes for Lucy Letby shouldn't be there because she wasn't there and the event in question was, uh, I, I forget which. So this uh, list of 25 at the beginning of the trial was reduced to 24 later and there are a couple more totally dubious events where really nothing happened and nobody, would, and whether Lucy was there or not is pretty irrelevant. Um, you can also see the row totals, which I think are important. The, the, the jury was not shown these, and you can quickly correlate those with night or day, night shifts and day shifts. And, and many night shifts are long, for many nurses, are long shifts, are 12 hour shifts. Uh, um, you see, so see big numbers for the day shifts and small numbers for the night shifts. And of course, a suggestion that uh, Lucy liked to kill during the night when there were less nurses around. Uh, how she could kill babies when there are 10 or 11 nurses all, <laughs> all allocated to the unit and busy there is, uh, as well as the doctors during the daytime, junior doctors, and just occasionally a, a, a consultant pediatrician coming by. Okay, so this is uh, supposed to give them an impression. It's a, it's a graphical representation of data. And the data has been, the important thing for a statistician is to know how were these events selected, who decided which events were suspicious. And this was never told to the jurors. Uh, well, maybe they learned a little, a little bit about it, but the defense seems not to have been interested in in that procedure. And the defense just, uh, as the trial itself, it went through event by event, uh, uh, looking at the evidence, uh, barristers cross-examining witnesses, some of whom were Lucy, other nurses, uh, parents, doctors, experts. Experts give testimony, um, but uh, experts can be cross-examined too. So the, the trial was run on an event by event basis and the defense was event by event. And actually, uh, I would like to say that the defense did not do a bad job for every, because for every single one of these events, they showed that there were, could, should be grave doubts as to whether Lucy had anything to do with it at all, any malicious thing to do with it at all. Uh, they basically showed they basically did 25 little trials and every time they showed that she should not be found guilty because it was not beyond reasonable doubt that she'd done anything. And in many cases, it was incredibly obvious she had done nothing bad whatsoever and certainly that she could not have done what the 
uh, prosecution experts alleged she had done. So the defense uh, did a sort of minimal defense and it should have been an adequate defense. And uh, nobody entered into the real issues about what could have been going on and what the big picture was. Of course, the defense are not uh, supposed, do not, are not obliged, don't have to come up with their own theory of what is going on. And in, in uh, uh, that's just not desired. They, they, they don't need to know. They haven't done the, the investigations themselves. They're reliant on investigations done by us. And they, they are not, they did not perform their own extensive forensic, statistical, and other investigation, and are not supposed to and not needed to. So they didn't uh, have much to say about why uh, the hell there should have been so many uh, deaths and, and uh, collapses and the like in that period, apparently, why they could have appeared to have been so many, it's not their job or responsibility to do so. But of course, it uh, comes across as weakness to jurors and jurors see this picture and they, uh, they get the message. Uh, I prefer this picture, by the way, I've here reordered the nurses by uh, the, the number of the events at which they are first present at one of the events. So you see top left, seven nurses were present during the first event in during the night, the night shift, baby A. Seven nurses were present and Lucy was one of them. Now it's interesting to uh, the, the reason I do this is it separates nurses to some extent uh, according to how um, how uh, often they are in the ward and uh, it separates, it allows you to see that it's probably likely that there are a few full-time nurses who are full-time and fully employed by the hospital working on this unit for these 18 months. I emphasize again, it's 18 months, not 12. It looks like 12, but it's 18. Uh, there are nurses who were there the whole time and working full time all those one and a half years. And there are many, many nurses who are part-time nurses who are working much less hours than the full-time nurses. There are many nurses who only work for short periods of time. There are so-called bank nurses. These are typically... <laughs> more highly paid nurses who have been fired but are still willing to come in and work from time to time when it's necessary. So there they are uh, a pool of nurses who have worked in the hospital and can come and work again when they're asked to and, and you know, are happy to do so, let's suppose. Uh, there are also agency nurses. The NHS relies more and more on agency nurses because it has cut fixed staff as much as possible, and it has cut it so much that from time to time, wards are too full, or uh, cases, uh, serious cases are too serious, uh, that more nurses are needed, and they have to be got from a, an agency who makes money by having their own pool of nurses, and uh, they are typically, I don't know if they're better paid or not. But anyway, there are many nurses who come in for a short time and other third parties are being paid to enable this, which is a waste of resources when it is needed so often. And that, the other thing you can see, which I want you to see, is the clustering vertically, which comes across much better now when you see <coughs> adjacent blocks of vertical X's, which of, and you can see the correlation between the twins and the triplets of these blocks. Uh, you see that there is time dependence in this. You can see there is heterogeneity between the nurses. The picture which you get here, which is a random scattering of X's or over all the other nurses, just random. All the nurses much the same. And Lucy let me sticking out like a sore thumb, whilst the idea of the picture to show she sticks out like a sore thumb, she's the graph has been engineered to make her stick out, out like a sore thumb. Now, um, okay, now we can talk about some statistical issues. This is a talk on statistics. And of course, the first question is, 
But should those events ever have been labelled unexpected? And uh, well, in order to find out, we have to know who labelled them unexpected. How did they do that? How did they do that? When did they do that? Uh, I've already touched on the fact that the nurses are definitely not exchangeable. We should not be looking at raw numbers. We should be looking at rates, events per events per hour, for instance. And such uh, analyses are starting to be done, though we don't. We have access to uh, a lot of data and information. We don't have what we really need, which would be a full staff roster of all the nurses, so we can see how many hours each nurse worked. Of course, it would be interesting to know how many hours the doctors were there and uh, other auxiliary staff who, uh, in principle, should also, well, certainly should also have been considered not necessarily as suspects as causing murder, but sh should have been caused, considered persons who might have inadvertently or, or through neglect or whatever caused events, bad events. Uh, we have some aggregate data from various levels of aggregation and, and there have been some fascinating statistical analysis already published by various uh, uh, persons, uh, professionals, uh, uh, including statisticians and uh, some names I mentioned here. Uh, we know a lot about the medical condition of each of the babies in the trial. I mean, each of the events in the trial, there's 25 events, because it, uh, the final days and hours of those babies were uh, told to the jurors in, in excruciating and saddening detail for 10 months long. And um, many doctors and other experts, well, I, and experts, doctors are not, are not scientific experts. Doctors are, have expertise, of course. And now I'm going to pause this. Pause, 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 pause. Which button do I press? Uh, I want to press the pause button. Okay, we go to Zoom. And we go to the meeting. We go to pause recording. Okay, now uh, I'm going to mention some of the st statistical uh, results which we do have already. Of course, they are provisional because uh, nobody has the data which they really need. Uh, but we do have a lot of data and we can use it and it tells us really important things. And first of all, the most the striking thing is that really there was not a spike at all. I mean, there was a spike, but the spike had, could very well have been completely natural. The patients uh, in the, coming into the unit through 2015 and halfway through 2016 were on the whole much more severely ill uh, so-called acuity, they had, were of babies of very high ac acuity than in previous years and later years. The actual number of early neonatal deaths is sort of what you would expect, is more or less what you would expect. And this, this does not statistically deviate from what should have been expected given the initial condition uh, uh, of those Babies and which, what factors can we use here? What is known initially? Well, there's the, uh, the length of the gestation. How long was the, how premature are these babies? A number of these babies are just at the border of, of uh, uh, life viability. Uh, a number of those babies uh, were so premature that they had a 50-50 chance of surviving a week. So, of course, a number of them died within a week. Unsurprisingly, a number died within a week. There were more factors, which we know of the number of those babies, uh, which mean they had their chances of life was out of the womb, was uh, 
uh, well, was very poor, uh, twins is a risk factor, triplet is a stronger risk factor, um, born by IV, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, um, pregnancy caused by IVF is a, a big risk factor. <laughs> of course, it uh, uh, typically also frequently produces multiple births and there are other uh, various uh, conditions of, of the mothers, which are risk factors, and even ethni ethnicity of the mothers. Um, uh, all, there are known factors, which mean that the number of patients who died is roughly what you would expect without any needs to assume somebody doing bad things. Another thing you can find out is that clusters like this, unexpected <laughs> clusters, are, 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 are common. Uh, and in fact, uh, this particular cluster is, is not one of the most surprisingly large sudden increases in an in a English hospital in, in, around this time, which was, has, has occurred. Um, a fact to, to take, bear in mind is that maternity care in the UK is bad and really every year there is a major scandal. The NHS is, is, is a, uh, the NHS is in a terrible, terrible state. It has been starved of money. Uh, it, it is overburdened with, with uh, bureaucracy. It is failing. It is known to be failing. At the same time, it is a national icon and uh, people have very strong feelings about the NHS. Uh, now, a, a statistical fact is that serial killer nurses are incredibly rare. Maybe once in a hundred years in the UK, maybe twice in a hundred years. Uh, uh, of course, there are more nurses and more hospitals now than there were a hundred years ago. So. Uh, these things are hard to say. There, there are, of course, many errors and inconsistencies being found in the, in the data that we do have. And this uh, shows that the, this, the statist statistical data is not it's very reliable. Anyway, not terribly reliable. And uh, one has to know that. Of course, finally, the important thing is the, the medical findings and uh, uh, by now it is becoming at last well known that medically that there is no reason whatsoever to believe that any of those events were, were murders or murderous attacks by anybody. Uh, we know a very great deal about what was going on in that unit and uh, the, the, that makes that uh, gives a completely different uh, interpretation of the medical picture. That, but that's another story because that's the medical story and I'm talking about statistics here. Now, how was that data gathered? Uh, okay, in around 2015, Lucy became uh, fully qualified and, and indeed the most qualified nurse on the unit and she was very energetic and, one, and a stickler for things being done properly and she filled in forms when she saw risks to patients, these Datix forms, that's what they're for. And the, the uh, senior pediatric doctors, consultant pediatricians on the ward got irritated by her. There was a, a, a real conflict between her and uh, Breary in particular, Dr. Breary, who was also, by the way, a well-known bully who had all the junior staff and all the nurses in tears one or two times. Um, two consultant pa pediatricians, Buri and Jairam, particularly got really uh, fed up with her and they wanted, to, they asked management to take her off the ward for, for spoiling the, that, the atmosphere. And uh, uh, I'll tell you some more about uh, what we know more about them in a little while. Of course, everybody was surprised by the number of unexpected deaths, which was not usual, but uh, 
uh, the severity of the cases on the unit was not usual either. And we actually do know now part of why that happened it was to do, due to closure of, of maternity units in nearby small hospitals in Wales. More patients coming, being sent, referred from Wales, North Wales, to, to the big hospitals in Liverpool. And sometimes Liverpool being full and then Chester being used as an overflow. So there were more babies coming to the unit in a, 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 with, uh, and mothers about to give birth uh, uh, in a very critical and worrisome uh, initial state. Uh, we, we know why that number went up. We know why that number went up and consequently the number of deaths went up exactly as, as one would have expected. And as the, I would like to say, as the consultant paediatricians, the most senior doctors on the unit, should have realised, one would have thought. Now, Lucy herself was worried because things kept work happening when she was there. Uh, she seems to have worked about 40% of the, the whole time. <laughs> you know, uh, she didn't work eight hours a day. Uh, she, she worked and with, with a long weekend. She worked very long hours and she fell in many times when the, the unit was short of nurses. She wanted to work hard because she wanted to gain experience. She liked her work very much indeed. But she was a few times devastated by the bad things that had happened, which she hadn't been able to stop. And she worried, was it her? And what, why were they always seemed to be happening when she was there? By the way, that's just like Lucia de Berg. Anyway, Breary and Jairam compiled a first spreadsheet and started gossiping. They were overheard. Uh, Jairam was overheard telling a colleague in the uh, uh, canteen queue for the midday meal. Uh, his uh, idea that maybe Lucy was harming babies. They informed the management, but they did not inform police. They did not fill in datix forms. Uh, this is uh, wrong. If a doctor fears that a nurse is harming babies, they should take action immediately. So, uh, they did. They went to management. They could have and should have gone to the police. In fact, they don't need police. And sorry, they don't need management permission to report what they believe is a crime to police. At the end of June 2016, the management called in the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health and Lucy was transferred to desk duties. And the unit was demoted to level one. Now, previously it had been uh, formally on paper, a so-called level two unit. You have level one, level two and level three. And as the level goes up, the unit is allowed to admit more premature babies and babies with uh, and mothers with more serious conditions. So level one is the ground level. Is uh, and uh, by the way, the Countess of Chester Hospital neonatal un intensive care unit is still a level one unit. Lucy uh, objects to being transferred. She felt she was being being harassed and being persecuted. Uh, the, her complaints were investigated by management and they were found to be unfounded. And Breary and Jairam in particular were told, were ordered to apologize in person to Lucy and to apologize by signing a letter to her. And uh, they both more or less did this, but uh, you can imagine what effect this had on their egos. The Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health visited the campus of Chester Hospital, I think six or seven senior pediatric doctors from around the country, and produced a devastating report blaming the management and doctors for all kinds of things badly wrong on that unit and exonerating the nurses in general and Lucy in particular. And uh, uh, maybe I should mention quickly a couple of the things they said, there should have been two ward rounds a day, not two ward rounds a week. The uh, junior doctors were very reluctant to, to call senior doctors when there were problems and senior doctors were reluctant to come. 
um, conditions were not good, uh, apparatus and staffing was insufficient, Number of, there were not enough senior nurses, um, really everything was wrong. All the things were wrong, which could easily explain, and well, the standard of care was, was abominable. Uh, let me say, I learned, that's let me give my interpretation. Of course, this was written in the very polite words, but it's very clear they found this was a, a, a failing neonatal unit and many, many changes had to be made. And in particular, the unit needed to get a neonatologist. It did not have a neonatologist. The report was published with uh, references to nurses and suspicion of nurses removed entirely in 2017. And uh, that was when Brieri and Jairam went to the police. They said that the deaths were totally abnormal. They said the deaths were, shouldn't happen on that unit. So, you know, one or two was terribly sad. It was normal, but this number was, was impossible. They gave, they went along to the police with, a, with an early version, the second version already of, the, of a spreadsheet with nurses and events, suspicious events. And the police inspector who heard them was convinced in 10 minutes that this was going to be, well, uh, my interpretation is he was convinced that this is going to be the biggest case of his career and the crown on his career, of course, catching a, a serial killer nurse and such a bad serial killer nurse. He was convinced in 10 minutes. Uh, I forget if he said so or if the doctors said so, but it has been said in the public, in interviews, in broadcast interviews. Breary and Jairam, uh, presumably, and uh, they're the ones who are responsible for collecting and co uh, uh, co collating medical dossiers, are arranged for 30, the medical dossiers of 30 babies, or maybe, was it 60? There are different numbers in different sources. For a long time, I thought it was 30. And I thought it was the, the all of the deaths, and then 15 other, like 15 deaths and 15 other round numbers. Maybe it was a few more. But that they brought medical dossiers of a selection of patients to the police. And certainly it included the dossiers of all the babies who had died. And of course, it included the dossiers of all the really serious uh, uh, events which had happened involving seriously ill babies. Uh, the twins and the triplets were all there. Um, of course, those were the ones they brought to the attention of the police. And by the way, our report says that in cases like this, all, all, all medical dossiers should be inspected of all babies, of all patients, and should be inspected for, by independent, independent um, outside experts uh, and uh, uh, suspicious events should be de defined. I mean, what a suspicious event is should be defined and should be searched for objectively through all the medical records. And this includes especially, of course, also collapses and crashes and resuscitations and not just deaths. And this was never done, of course. This was never done. Of course. So the uh, you see here already the painting of the target around the victim, Lucy, the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Uh, those 30 or 16 medical dossiers contained uh, pertain to the most seriously ill babies where the most things happened. And Lucy being most working most hours on the unit was mostly there for much for some of the time that those babies were on the unit. Here they are, Stephen Breary and Ravi Jayaram, just to give you a picture. <laughs> and I had a th third person here, Dowie Evans, who now is going to enter the story. Uh, but before I get to him, just to mention evidence which did not make it to court, the post-mortem reports of, of, of pathologists, uh, of autopsy reports of all the babies who died which say they died of natural causes. 
uh, and sometimes causes could not be ascertained, but the death were natural. The death was natural anyway, and no, no, sort of no point in saying what, what was the final or the initial. The babies died of prematurity, extreme prematurity. That's uh, what uh, a, a uh, coroner could could write on the coroner's report. The r report of the Royal College of Pediatric Pediatrics and Child Health was not discussed in court. And uh, here are the uh, uh, things I've already said about it, so I don't need to say that again. The report did say that there were events which were hard to explain. One of the reasons being that the doctors had not kept, had not preserved samples, had not performed sufficient investigations at the time when it still could have been done of events which they didn't understand. The, the doctors were blamed for the fact that some events are hard to explain now. Um, the uh, report said the unit must stay level one. Uh, it recommended a forensic investigation into the events which were, were difficult to understand, which were a number. And uh, I'm not sure if I was right in the slides, but that, that, that that recommended investigation was performed. And moreover, it's now very clear that the uh, things we didn't, which were not well understood at the time, were very much associated with sepsis, with infection, sepsis. Uh, it, uh, and there are very good reasons for it, as I'll also explain. Well, the place was pretty filthy. Let me just say that. So Dowie Evans uh, suddenly turned up. He was is a long retired pediatrician from South Wales. Uh, he's, he drove all the way, he said, to Chester because he heard about the case. He read about the case in the Sunday papers and thought, this is a case for me. He has a lot of experience in, in uh, child custody cases. Uh, he has a business, in fact, uh, uh, advising one side or the other. In, in cases where one of the parents is accused of harming the child and, and hence the child must be given to the other parent. And uh, he makes uh, good money doing that job. Now, he went through the jumbled stack of medical documents. I mean, he, he said they were to totally mixed up himself. And everywhere where he saw something which, about which, which he could use as the basis of a fantasy or of a murder, he, he said, this is something. Uh, it, for instance, he saw a number of times bubbles of air or gas on post-mortem x-rays. Now, <laughs> two uh, energetic CPR on premature babies can cause air bubbles in the body. Of course, death produces air bubbles or well, gas bubbles in the body. On, the, on those post more on an x-ray you can't see where a bubble is because it could be behind or in front of what the other objects which you see there <laughs> remember so he, his his idea that he could see evidence of uh, that Lucy had well that a person had deliberately injected air into the veins of a baby in order to kill it is uh, is a fantasy, is a fantasy. And we know it is a fantasy now because at last now in one of the retrials or the uh, applications for an appeal, failed applications for an appeal, um, uh, we have now heard that the air embolism story is, is ludicrous. And we've heard from other medical experts that sepsis is a very important cause of death and cause of certain phenomena, uh, a, a mottled skin, a strange uh, shifting pattern uh, of mottling on, on the skin of some babies had got nothing whatsoever to do with, with air embolism and probably a very great deal to do with, with bacterial or viral infection. Or with, or with imminent, or with imminent collapse, uh, cardiorespiratory collapse. Now, uh, 
Evans wasn't the only person who helped the police out interpreting the medical documents which they'd received. Uh, Breary came by too, and he found two anomalous immunoassay results for insulin C-peptide ratio of babies being treated for hypoglycemia. <laughs> and it, it was a bit odd that he found these because the doctors who were treating the babies for hypoglycemia, um, the doctors who were actually there, the junior doctors hadn't even told the consultants that they had had these tests done and what the result was. The babies uh, were getting better and left the hospital. And actually, Evans found a third anomalous immunoassay result. Now, there's actually statistics and probability in the toxicology of this particular uh, test, and I'm not going to talk about it here, but. Uh, it's very clear now <clears throat> that this, this uh, medical test is utterly inconclusive and utterly inadequate for proving that anybody had given those babies insulin, which they should not have had. And of course, already the, during the trial, the defense had shown that Lucy couldn't have given the insulin, which at that during the trial was generally thought to have been given to those babies. It's certainly one of the smoking guns which convinced jury, presumably, that murders had been taken place. And then Lucy was the suspicious person who it should who must have done it, since nobody else who was on trial, and one could say. Um, I've mentioned what the defense uh, did. Uh, the defense called one expert who was a plumber, a plumber who made weekly visits to combat sewage backflow and leaking sewage pipes. Uh, that's um, interesting and important in connection with possible uh, sepsis and inf inf uh, infections, uh, as I mentioned uh, on that slide. <clears throat> also, actually, the defense did have one medical expert and he just waited in court every day, but was never called to the stand. And this is extraordinary and quite scandalous. And he has recently written to the British Medical Journal and saying how scandalous this was and saying what he would have said if he would have had been called. Um, the pro problem was that a good medical expert cannot say what the babies actually did die of. No medical expert knows but there were eight prosecution medical experts who were absolutely certain in their judgments of what had caused the deaths of various babies and various uh, collapses or, or, or of babies. And the fact that they were certain shows that they were not experts because an expert, a scientific expert must always give uh, error margins, error bars, probabilities, alternative explanations. Uh, that's one thing. So medical experts who say uh, they are certain are not experts. Uh, they are just doctors making judgments as they usually do to patients. And they have to make judgments because they have to treat patients and they have to treat them fast. So they judge all the time. They are not suitable to be so they cannot act really in on the whole as uh, scientific experts in 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 a criminal court. Uh, moreover, a number of the experts, in particular the experts who uh, pontificated, no, sorry, who pronounced their certainty about the insulin babies, the uh, two insulin babies, we could say, um, they clearly did not know the literature. And in fact, one of them, one of the medical experts is actually the co-author of a very important paper about diagnosing in, a, in the forensic situation, in the in a criminal court for, for, for forensic purposes, uh, determining, not guessing, but determining insulin poisoning, deliberate insulin poisoning, presumably deliberate insulin poisoning, uh, that the, one of the experts wrote one of the key papers in that area and did not 
follow their own recommendations, which were to use a different test in order to uh, and or and or do supplementary tests to rule out alternative explanations, of which there are many alternative explanations, of which there are many for an anomalous insulin C peptide ratio. Well, what happened during the outside the courtroom is important. I think I'm nearly at the end of the uh, these slides now. Uh, during the trial, a number of persons started criticizing the scientific uh, evidence in the case, I mean the evidence which needed scientific interpretation, both statistically and medically. Uh, we were made out, we were uh, attacked by the police, threatened by the police, intimidated by the police, and we were made out to be sick and deluded conspiracy theorists by the newspapers and in social media. And in, indeed, the witch hunt was so intense that anybody who had any doubts in England about the safety of this uh, trial, about the possible possibility that Lucy was innocent, most people who had such doubts wouldn't dare express them to friends or family, to closest friends or even to closest friends or nearest family. And uh, some people were, well, of course, uh, the Twitterers on Twitter started calling for restoration of the death penalty. Well, right now, we are also called uh, armchair conspiracy theorists, uh, in particular by the Times, because uh, things have changed. And I think um, uh, this possibly is the last slide. Not quite. No, no, not at all. But anyway, um, Times are changing. There's been a sea change. Uh, I would say the dam is bursting. Uh, the dam is cracking and it's going to give way pretty soon. And already at the beginning of this year, a very long article was published in the New Yorker by Rachel Aviv. And a New Yorker had paid for complete official trial transcripts. And she goes through a huge amount of, of the trial evidence, and it, it, it is a devastating read. It, it shows the convictions are unsafe. Um, a bit later, after that, that was already before the trial had finished, and it was geo-blocked in the UK. British persons are not allowed to read this, not allowed to know this, but uh, as soon as reporting restrictions were relaxed, though they were in force again for, for a retrial and, and uh, a, a retrial asked for by the prosecution of one of the not guilty, or sorry, non, the non-verdicts. Um, it, it came back in again and it, the reporting restrictions were on again when uh, Lucy's application to appeal was, was uh, judged by three judges who turned it down. But okay, there has have been windows of opportunity to to publish critical material on the trial and on the going into the science, going into the statistics, and the Guardian has published a, a major article. Probably more will be coming. The Daily Telegraph did the same, uh, based partly on the same information and partly on others. And the important thing is that these are. Uh, a major respectable left-wing or liberal type in British sense newspaper and a major, uh, I'm not sure if I would say reliable about the te Daily Telegraph, but it's a major serious <laughs> right-wing newspaper. And so both left and right wings of the established media have published severe, severe criticism of the case, uh, doubts about the convictions. Of course, the newspapers will not say they, anybody thinks that Lucy is innocent, but they will, do say that she, the trial was not safe, the convictions are not safe, the trial was biased, there is important evidence which the jurors didn't, they didn't know, were not given. There has been part one of a documentary, brilliant doctrine, 
documentary on Channel 5. So things are shifting and more documentaries are on the way. Um, uh, the system does not want uh, uh, to have the case reopened. Um, there have been a number of uh, rulings made by judges. For instance, science, which was known pre-trial but not used by the defense, may not be used to appeal against the convictions. Um, the judge told the jury in a retrial for baby K, where there had been no verdict, that they need not take any notice of evidence they heard, which said, <laughs> which was devastating for the prosecution because it showed that star witness Ravi Jayaram uh, was not telling the truth and that Lucy was telling the truth on the baby K case. Uh, there was no uh, attack by, by Lucy. But uh, the judge told the jury they should they need not take any notice of evidence because they've uh, provided that they trust the previous convictions. And uh, in, probably they did because they only needed two hours to pass a guilty verdict. So with this brought the full life uh, convictions up from 15 to 16. So this was another nail in the coffin. Now, the, these rulings mean that there is no hope of going to the CCRC, the Com Commission for Closed, um, mm, I forget what CCRC stands for, but it's the only way you can reopen a closed case in Britain at present, officially, uh, because uh, uh, there will not be any new evidence and the new, and the of course, I mean, as long as there is no new evidence, that you cannot go to the CCRC. Uh, the uh, court existing rulings by the court mean uh, that that uh, uh, the the court the case could the CCRC will know that an appeal court will not consider the case in view of the rulings of the previous appeal court which says that new scientific interpretation of existing uh, evidences is not new evidence, is no grounds to reopen a case. Well, there's an inquiry coming. It's going to be interesting. There's more going on. What will happen next? Uh, at the end, I have two, I believe I have two slides, yes. And in these two slides, I give you some ideas what you can do. Now, for instance, if you are British, you can write to your MP. <laughs> to ministers and state secretaries of state, you can talk to your friends and families, friends and family, find out what they think, find out if they're convinced that Lucy is a witch, find out why. That's something you can do. There are some petitions you can sign, you can find them easily. There's petitions calling for a release of the date which is missing, namely the complete nursing rosters and other rosters and, and more data on on the the other babies in the in the unit. Statisticians can look at the data which we have already and the statistical analysis which have already been done and do better ones. Publish academic papers using material from the case as an example. Discuss pros and cons of different methodologies. Bring in some new ones, right? If you're into artificial intelligence and uh, uh, who isn't these days, uh, see what you can do. See what you can do with the latest new tools of, of statisticians. There's lots of data out there. There's a very challenging issue of combining information from, from uh, uh, aggregate data collected by government agencies, for instance, combining that with uh, individual data, specific data, case-specific data. Uh, there are big statistical issues there. There were great talks about those issues at the conference I visited. There were many talks about using AI in statistics and, of course, the usual uh, hype. And I'm afraid I have the usual, the same worries, that if you don't tell the AI uh, thing about data which is not available, it's not going to come up by itself with the idea that such data 
would be needed to investigate hypotheses which were not uh, uh, offered uh, during the trial which, uh, and which have been suppressed in, uh, uh, in, in the public discourse. Um, I would like to see causality experts doing some work here. For, for example, I, I would like to know if high-risk babies had not gone to Chester, but had gone to a level two or a level three in ICU as appropriate, would that have saved many deaths? I think not many, but maybe a few. And of course, uh, the uncertainty in statistical calculation, um, the confidence interval, or whatever you want to call it, prediction intervals, retrodiction, counterfactual retrodiction intervals would have been so big that we can't say anything. Uh, that would be interesting to know. There is a lot of uh, discussion about uh, 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 the fact that sepsis was clearly a factor in many of those deaths and is clearly a factor that was not recognized by doctors or nurses and at the time it was very often not recognized and at the time the danger of hospital I mean hospital <laughs> evolved viruses and bacteria was uh, less known so there are a couple of things you can do, and this is the last, if you're a statistician, uh, and this is the last slide of the talk, and now I will stop the recording and hope, well, I will take, go back to the first page, Oop. give you another chance to zap those QR codes, read the report, think about it. Now I have to find the button to stop the recording. Yes, stop recording.